I'm John McCutcheon, and welcome to this homespun video on instruction in the hammer dulcimer. Now, in order to prepare you for what's going to be happening in the next hour or so, I first of all need to issue some disclaimers about this particular instrument because it may be considerably different from yours. However, with a few explanations, I'm sure that you're going to be able to adapt very, very easily. First of all, and most obviously, I have some pickups here on the instrument, these black strips going down there. They are not the part of a normal hammer dulcimer, and you should ignore them as you're looking uh, at me playing some uh, various things here. Secondly, we've got these large wooden contraptions going down on the side here. Now, what these are is, this is a sort of a new little uh, experiment that I've been fooling with. These are dampers, which are activated by a foot pedal here. I'll be talking a little bit more about this uh, permutation of this instrument at the end of the video, so you may want to adapt some of these things to your own particular instruments. Third is this short bridge up in the upper left-hand corner of the instrument. What this is, is it's a collection of random notes that will complete the chromatic possibilities of this instrument. Now, this is something else I'll be talking about later on in the video. And finally, you'll notice that the two bridges, the treble bridge here in the center and the bass bridge over here on the right, are, unlike your instruments, uneven. The treble bridge is chopped off at the end. I'll be explaining a little bit about that, but for the purposes of this uh, video, and to standardize this to all the many different players who are going to have different sorts of instruments, I'm going to make this instrument a 12-11 instrument. And in order to do that, I'm going to take off this bottom chorus here so that what we've got here is approximately what you have on your instruments. And for the purposes of this instruction, the bottom three courses here of the bass bridge are, should be ignored. So yours should start here, which if you look at your tuning charts will be a G. And the bottom note on the right-hand side here of the treble bridge will be the C sharp. Now that we're all done with that, we're ready to go on. So let's talk about what to call these different parts of the instrument now that I've told you how different your instrument is from mine. Over in the middle here, we've got the treble bridge. You'll be playing on both sides of the treble bridge. The treble bridge will divide each string that passes over it into two separate notes. Over on the right here, we have the bass bridge. You will only be playing on the left side of the bass bridge. On either side of your instrument, you're going to have some tuning pegs here. And that is what you'll be turning to get your instrument in tune. We'll be talking about that shortly. Now, let's go back to the main body of the instrument. To help you out, I'm going to put a little piece of electrical tape on the bottom three courses of the bass bridge so as not to confuse you with uh, the markings that we're just about to talk about. Over here in the center of the treble bridge, you'll notice that this course of strings, this is what we call it, a course, C-O-U-R-S-E is divided into two notes, as I mentioned earlier. Now, my instrument here just has two strings per chorus. Historically, it used to be a matter of prestige how many strings you had per chorus. If you had six strings per chorus, it meant that you had a better instrument. Basically, today, what it means is you have six strings per chorus rather than two. You have three times as much tuning to do. So you may try getting down to just two strings per chorus. Now these are tuned in unison. Each of the strings in each chorus is tuned in unison. And so on. Now opening up here, you'll notice that every third chorus here is indicated by a white marking. You want to start your marking going from the bottom of the treble bridge here. Leave the first one unmarked, that's a, the C sharp uh, for the notes on the right. The D above that is your first marked one, 
skip two, mark the next, skip two, mark the third, skip two, mark the third. The same thing over here on the treble, on the bass bridge, except you mark the bottom note. Mark, skip two, mark, skip two, mark, skip two, mark, and so on. Now, I've been relating all this to a 1211 instrument. What do I mean by that? A 1211 instrument has 12 sets of courses on the treble bridge and 11 sets of courses on the bass bridge. When you talk to dulcimer players, that's the kind of nomenclature, the kind of language they're going to be using to describe what kind of instrument they have. There's also a very popular uh, model of instrument called the 1514. That means 15 treble courses, 14 bass courses, or 18, 17, and so on. The first number indicates how many treble courses there are, the second, bass courses. And this brown bar with the brass screws here, just to the left of the upper end of the treble bridge, is in fact the anchoring device for the uh, high treble bridge. What these markings will do is provide you with valuable landmarks in getting around the instrument. Each marking here is the beginning of a major scale. Let's start over on the right-hand side of the treble bridge here at the second marked course. This is Do, and each consecutive one up the same side of the bridge. Re, Mi, Fa, you're up to the next marking. Go back to where you started, go over to the left-hand side. You'll be the same string here. Sol, La, Ti, Do. Anywhere you start, let's go down to the first one here. Up to the next, back to the left. Now the relationship from the right to the left-hand side of the treble bridge is duplicated from the bass bridge over to the right-hand side of the treble bridge. Let's try this. Second marked chorus bass bridge. Up to the next. Go back to where you started. Go across here to the left of this marked chorus. So you see what the instrument really is, is a repetition of sets of four choruses here. The top of one is the bottom of another. So they're stacked up on top of, underneath, and next door to one another. Understanding that relationship on the instrument will make everything that comes after this so much easier. Well, now that we know how to talk to one another about the different parts of the instrument, it's time to play. But of course, before we play, we have to get this darn thing in tune. Now, this is not as scary a process as you might think. Suffice it to say that I've never known anyone who gave up playing this instrument because they could not get it in tune. And there's going to be a couple things that will be important and helpful in learning to tune that will also relate to the rest of your playing, make it seem a lot more sensible. So let's look at the instrument for a second here. We've been talking about the marked choruses. Now, you will notice that every chorus is related to these markings by being on it, directly below it, or directly above it. There are no exceptions on the dulcimer. Every chorus is related to those markings in that way. So it'll make it easy for us to refer to a particular chorus. For instance, let's talk about the left-hand side of the treble bridge, second marked chorus. Here's the left-hand side of the bridge, second marked chorus, right here. That's the string we're talking about. Now I'm going to start on this string to show you one of the two principles that I want to relate to you in terms of tuning. And the first is duplicated notes. Every marked chorus has a duplicated note. To find that duplicated note, play the marked chorus, go across to the related chorus to the right, count that as number one, and count up five. One, two, three, four, five. Same note in the same octave. Let's go down to the first mark chorus, across the right, up five. Now you remember that I said the relationship between this side of the bridge and this side of the bridge is duplicated over on the bass bridge. So let's go back up here to the second mark chorus on the right-hand side of the treble bridge. Got the marking over here, up five. One, two, three, four, five. Works down here. Now when this doesn't work, is when we run out of dulcimer. For instance, let's try the third marked chorus here. You go across to the right, one, two, three, four. Wait a minute. Now, some dulcimers have that, but this one doesn't. And of course, the top one up here doesn't have it either. 
Now the marked courses are not the only courses that this works for. This also works for every course above a marked course. Let's take a look. Here's the course above the marked, first marked course, left-hand side of the treble bridge, across to the right, up five. Again, this will work for every <coughs> course above a marked course until we run out of instrument. The other principle that I want to talk about is octaves. Now octaves are even easier and they work for every course on the instrument. Back here, let's take the first mark chorus, right hand side of the treble bridge. What you do is you go across to the left, count that as one, go up four. All the way up, same thing over here on the bass bridge, and so on. Now, I have not been avoiding talking about the names of these notes, A, B, C sharp, and so on, for any other purpose other than to, sh to show you that you can play this instrument totally visually. And those of you who don't read music, who perhaps this is the first instrument you've ever played, you've come to the right place. So let's get this instrument in tune. There's one very important tool that will really help you get this instrument in tune, and that is this little tuning wrench right here. Now many of you will have already received some kind of a tuning wrench when you got your instrument, but this particular kind of wrench is uh, a revolutionary device in terms of cutting down your tuning time. Now the thing about tuning, as far as I'm concerned, is the more time you spend tuning, the less time you spend playing. And if you've got kids or you've got you know, job that takes a lot of time or other activities in your life, you've maybe got 30 minutes an hour a, a day, if you're lucky, to play. So anything that can help you trim down your tuning is something you ought to check out. So this thing right here is called, uh, generically, I guess, a gooseneck star bit. Gooseneck because it's got this long neck and a star bit because it's got an eight-point star in the middle there, rather than your uh, four point, which is easy to strip out. If you get one of these, you can get them for, oh, 10 bucks, I guess. It would, it's really gonna cut your tuning time in half. The first time I used one of these, my tuning time was cut by a third. And that meant I had that much more time to play. So, the reason that a lot of, that some builders suggest you don't use this is because it's easy to strip the pins. But let me show you a little secret that piano tuners use, which will help you not strip your pins. Now you see these pegs are four-sided. And when you put a, a wrench on there, it's easy to get it on crooked if you're in a hurry. So what you do is just take your time a little bit, set it down there, and then go out to the end of the wrench and wiggle it a little bit and it's gonna seat right down there and it'll be nice and firm and you're never gonna have to worry about stripping your pin out. Now the advantage to this kind of a tuning wrench is the length of the handle here. Now, the short auto harp tuning wrench only has a handle about this long, and there's another kind of wrench which commonly comes with hammer dulcimers these days, which is a T-wrench. Just has a handle directly above the uh, bit here. With this, you have a lot more leverage, and when you wanna make small adjustments, it's much easier to do it with a nice long handle like that. Now you don't necessarily just have to go ahead and get one of these. You can take all your T-Ranch and just tape a, a long stick to it. Now there's two ways to tune, by eye and by ear. Let's do it by ear first. This is A440, the left-hand side of the treble bridge, first marked course. You can get that note from a tuning fork, from a piano, any instrument that you know to be in tune. Because this is a marked course, the first thing you do is you catch all the duplicated notes. You know how to do that. Cross to the right, up five. Here's it above a marked course. Let's go across to the right, up five. Now, if you've got one side of the treble bridge in tune, it's safe to assume the other side will likewise be in tune. Now, this is a marked course also. Cross to the right, up five. The one you caught originally is also above a marked course. You can catch another one of those. So 
off that single note, you were able to find a whole bunch of duplicated notes. Once you run out of the duplicated notes, you come back and you get the octaves. And so on. But basically, the, the whole idea, the whole idea is that you exhaust all the possibilities of the duplicated notes. As soon as you've gotten all the duplicated notes you possibly can, you get all the octaves. Now, using that on the instrument, you'll be able to get every note on your instrument in tune except for one note. And it's this note right here, B flat, right here, fourth mark chorus on the bass bridge. And you can get that by either using your scales, going up here, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, or between any note on the instrument and a note, three notes above it, is a perfect fourth, which is like, here comes the bride. That works for any note on the instrument. Now, I mentioned that there were two ways to tune by ear and by eye. I use the latter, and what I mean by eye is you use one of these little electronic tuners. There are many varieties. I use this little Korg. The model is DT1. It's relatively inexpensive. As you can see, it's very small. It's about the size of a cassette. Fits in your case easily. And it will tell you when you're in tune with a little meter here. Now, the reason I use this is because I don't want to spend all my time tuning. I want to get to playing. Now, on this video so far, we've spent all our time establishing the different areas of the instrument and how to get this thing in tune. Now, we're ready to play. You need to get yourself a set of hammers. I tend to like this kind of hammer right here. It's called a pistol grip hammer because of the grip that fits so conveniently right in there. You'll need two of them. And just get them to where they're comfortable on your hands. And I, uh, I tend to like to have them held fairly loose in there so that you get a lot of bounce. Now, when you start playing, you're going to notice that one hand is going to behave itself real well. It may be your right, it may be your left. It doesn't really seem to matter. But one of them will probably be fine, and the other one is going to seem like it belongs to somebody else. So just go, go with the one immediately that feels comfortable. I don't, mind, I don't want to give you a bunch of exercises so that you become an incredibly disciplined musician, but rather that you start playing music. So let's just go through those scales once, just to get the feel of the, of, the, of the hammers. You can do it one at a time, one hand at a time. Or sort of do an echo with both hands. But playing scales is a long way from playing music. So let's just have at a tune right now. I'll play a tune called Golden, Golden Slippers. It's a very well-known tune, one you've probably heard. If you don't know it, you'll learn it very shortly because it's very easy. Here we go, Golden Slippers. We're going to start at the left-hand side of the treble bridge, second marked chorus. It's a D. Let me play it for you, and then I'll slow it down and, and uh, we'll scope it out together. So there's our first tune. It's a very simple arrangement of golden slippers. And you'll notice I play most of it favoring my right hand. Now, the dulcimer is an instrument that favors neither a left-handed person or a right-handed person, one over the other. If you feel as though you want to lead out with your left, go with it. With your right, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. So using the rewind on your VCR, go back as many times as you need to 
until you can play that tune note for note the way I played it. It doesn't matter if you're doing exactly the hammering. What is important is that you're playing those notes. Now let me show you why I favored one hand so much over the other and how that can help you establish your hammering ideas. I played What I was doing was my right hand was playing on all the down beats, the pulses of the tune. And my left hand was filling in the off beats. Now, in doing that, what you'll be able to do is create a skeleton of a tune. That way, when you add the extra notes, you'll still have the basic structure intact and all you have to do is add your subordinate hand. Let me show you. Another way of expanding this tune could go Now, you'll notice what I did is my right hand still played exactly the same thing as it was playing before. It was going... It was my left hand that was added. So that every time you add a note with your left hand or another note to the tune, you aren't going to have to completely change your hammering after that. It's a great way to make hammering seem kind of like a, a natural thing that you fall into. Obviously, you're going to have times when you need to switch your hammering, but using that as a basic guideline, that's a great way to get going and playing some music right away on the dulcimer. So, now, I'm going to be playing some stuff that's going to seem as though it's going to be too fast for you to pick up visually. What you need to do in use of a, a video to learn this instrument is I'll slow all that stuff down for you, but the important thing is that you get it in your ears. Try to digest the tune until you know in your, in your head exactly what you want it to sound like and that you don't only relate it to a visual series of patterns. Because the important thing is, is that when this video runs out and you don't have me to teach you tunes anymore, you still are able to get tunes from a lot of non-video sources, put them in your head, and then spit them back out off of the end of your hammers. That will also help you create arrangements uh, of your own tunes, of other people's tunes, and you can really start playing music, because really all I'm showing you is the athletics of playing the dulcimer. Music happens in here, and if you can listen to me play something and get it up here and get it out the end of your hammers, then you can be uh, more attuned to the kind of music you're going to be creating up in your own head. The arrangements, the original music, all that stuff. Take my word, it's really going to make a big difference if you also memorize the stuff and not only relate it to visual patterns. So let me play uh, a whole version, uh, an expanded version of Golden Slippers for you. I'm going to add some other notes. For instance, I'm going to uh, add this note down here, which you'll know from your theory of duplicated notes is the same note here. Now here's, a, here's a, an instance in which you're going to have to make a decision uh, based on your knowledge of duplicated notes. If you lead with your left hand, for instance, on a pickup note here, you'll want to use the, the note above the second marked course, right hand side of the treble bridge. You would go. If you lead with your right hand, on the other hand, you're going to pick up with your left. Okay, same thing over here. I'm going to add this note on the bass bridge, which is duplicated down here. So here's Golden Slippers.
Now that may seem like a big bite to chew on right now, but again, using the, uh, re the rewind on your VCR, going back over it, and most importantly, little sections at a time, memorizing what the notes are supposed to sound like. I think you'll probably get it quickly. Now, what we've, what we've launched into here is not only learning a tune, but starting to learn an arrangement, and I threw some harmony in on you here, that first line. Now, most people, when they want to learn how to play a tune, don't want to just know the melody line. They want to know how to arrange it, how to add harmony, how to add little rhythmic things here and there that make the tune uh, exciting and make it their own. So what we have here is we have two hammers playing at the same time on different notes. This is what I call a cross bridge harmony. You're playing the melody note on one side of the bridge and the cross bridge on another side of the bridge. Cross bridge harmony could also go over here or as long as you are have playing the melody in one playing area and the harmony in another playing area, we'll call that a cross bridge harmony. Another kind of harmony that we'll be talking about is third harmony, where you simply skip a note, either up or down, and you play the note. That's a third harmony. It works on any note of the instrument. Cross bridge, likewise, will work on any note of the instrument. So immediately, you've got two different kinds of harmonies you can go to. In uh, Golden Slippers, you can also break up the harmonies, not only play them together, but you can play them in sequence, like the end of the phrases. So you've got a tune down, and you've got some different uh, simple harmonies to add in there. So go ahead, back up, spend some time with this tune because uh, you've got a lot of stuff all of a sudden coming together. So don't be afraid to be very, very simple at first. Play the first version of the tune without the harmonies, without the added notes, and when you know that version, then go on and add the extra notes and the harmonies that we just finished playing. And when you're done with that, Turn the tape back on, and we'll tackle, an, tackle another tune. Good luck. Welcome back. Now that you've got that tune under your belt, I want to show you something that you can do with that tune to start learning about different parts of the instrument. When we were talking about the octave and uh, duplicated note theory, I showed you that there are octaves for every note on the instrument. So what you could do, for instance, is move this down an octave. You started here. Move it over and down. You can also move it up to the next marked choruses because you started on a marked chorus here. Move it up to the next marked chorus. Or across the bridge. The point being, that as long as you play the geometry, if you will, of the tune exactly the same, if you're starting on a mark chorus, you just simply move to another mark chorus, and as long as you're not going to run off the end of the dulcimer or you can't move any further to the right or left, it doesn't matter where you play it, you're ending up playing in a different key. This makes it one of the simplest instruments to transpose. On. So, for instance, if you learn a tune, say, in the key of D, as we learned Golden Slippers, and you decide that you want to go to a square dance, for instance, to practice your tunes, and the fiddle player there plays in the key of G, all you have to do is get up to the key of G here, four courses up. Or you decide for arrangement purposes that you want to go ahead and switch over to the key of C or F or whatever. Just remember, as long as you play the patterns relating to the marked courses in exactly the same way, 
you know that you're going to know this tune all over the instrument. Now, why is it important to know that if everybody always plays it in, say, the key of D? What's happening here is we're going to start utilizing some of these tunes so that you can learn about the dulcimer in general. As I mentioned earlier, I'm as concerned about what you know about playing the instrument. In fact, more concerned about that than whether you know all the tunes that are on this tape. So what we're going to be do doing from now on is relating new techniques to not only these tunes, but to how you can use them on your own so that this, these aren't the only tunes that you know. Let's go on to another tune, though. This is another popular one called Liberty. Let me run it through for you. Now, I took that through at a pretty good clip for those of you who are just starting out. So let me slow it down, and little by little, I'll show you how to play the tune, starting with the first line. The second part now. Now, what you've seen is that there are certain similarities in the two parts of the tune. For instance, the ending of each part goes. And you're doing cross bridge harmony here. There's sort of a classical form for these tunes, and that is that there is a, an A part or a first part and a B part, a second part and that each part is repeated. There are lots of exceptions in the field of traditional music, but it's a good rule of thumb that if you learn a tune, it's, the form is going to be A-A-B-B. Now getting back here, one thing you noticed is that I had certain pickup notes. In other words, quick notes that led up to a strong downbeat. If I were going to exaggerate it, I would go, Now, the difference here is that your right hand or your strong hand, again, you left-handers, I'm not discriminating against you. I'm just uh, going to try to standardize it here, and I'll issue a blanket disclaimer right now. Your right hand or your strong hand is going to be like a rock. It plays on the downbeat, and it doesn't waver. It's your left hand that adds all the syncopation and the little grace notes. Watch this. Now, if I were really going to exaggerate that, you could see how you can use the left hand to do all kinds of anticipations. And your right hand is going to act as the standard off of which the left hand is going to play. Watch this now.
right hand is always right there. Bum, 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 bum. The anticipation comes with your subordinate hand. It's as though your right hand is forming the beat and your left hand is the one that can play around with that. Now, as the video here progresses, you're going to see how graphically that's, this can be used in many different ways. But think of it this way, that your strong hand is going to be the rock. Just keeps going on the beat. And if you have a sense that you want to put any anticipations or any kind of syncopations in, look to your subordinate hand for doing that. Now let's take a look at some of these harmony possibilities that you can do here. I'm just going to play around a little bit and add some different kinds of harmonies and uh, see if you can't pick some of these up. slow down some of these runs, what I was doing, a third harmony there. Or breaking him up. It's the same as this, but you're just making them into an arpeggio, a broken chord. One thing you're going to hear me talking about over and over again is whenever you learn to do something on the dulcimer, thinking, try to think of as many different ways as you can do it. For instance, taking these chords which you're playing together, or the, the harmonies, or you could play and play them as separate notes as... Just try fooling around with them um, as much as you can. Try breaking, breaking up chords that you're playing together. Try playing chords together that you're breaking up. Try anticipating those. Add little grace notes. Try leaving notes off because rests have just as much important in music as notes. And often what you take out what you leave off is just as important as stuff that you can add in. And uh, one of the pitfalls of playing the hammer dulcimer is it's easy to play things too fast. It's easy to put in lots of notes. And you're frequently going to find yourself pulling in the reins and saying, wait a minute, this isn't musical anymore. This is just flaunting all the technical stuff I can do. So experiment around as much as you can. The, the uh, dulcimer, as you will quickly see, is a very geometric instrument, and it suits itself to uh, thinking about triangles. Like this triangle right here. See, you've got a, you got a, a third harmony and a cross bridge harmony right here. And if you put them together, it makes a nice little triangle. And it coincidentally also makes a chord. And that's what I want to take a little side trip right now and talk to you about playing chords. Most people think of the hammer dulcimer as, an, as a melody instrument. They don't think of it, number one, as an accompanying instrument for other melodies. Number two, they don't think of it as an accompanying instrument for song. And they, don't, they rarely think about it of playing chords at all. So I want to show you how you can combine our third harmonies here and the cross bridge harmonies and you can play chords. Now, 
Chords are the basis for finding harmony on the instrument. You can build a chord on any single note on the instrument. It doesn't matter. Let me show you. Let's just randomly pick out a note. Okay. Now, first, first thing you do is you build your third harmony. And you can go up or down to build a third harmony. Let's just say we're going to go up. So you skip a note here and play the next note. Now, within these three courses here, you are going to find the third member of your triad, of your chord. And because you're on the right-hand side of the treble bridge, you have two places you can go. You can go to the left, over to the left-hand side of the treble bridge, or you can go to the right, to the bass bridge. Let's say that we're going to go to the right, over to the bass bridge. So within these three courses right here, you are going to find one member of the chord. You will be able to make one chord out. You will frequently be able to make two chords, and uh, in terms of major and minor, you're not going to be able to make three, but always one, frequently two. So let's start with the top note right here. Oh, yeah. Here is our uh, major chord. Now, because you've only got two hands, you're going to have to uh, have some kind of rule of thumb for figuring out where all, whether all these work together. And that is that each member of the chord has to harmonize with every other member of the chord. So, going back here, you've got these two. And you know these two work. Do these two work? Oh, yeah. So these three make a major chord. But as I mentioned, you might be able to find more than one. So let's go to the next chorus down. Oh yeah, nice minor chord. And just for the sake of argument, let's go down to the, the next one and see whether this, wor this works. That sounds pretty good. This third we know works, but how about this? Now in terms of our understanding of major and minor chords, we know that that a minor seventh is not going to work. I'm not going to tell you it's wrong, but in relating it to major and minor chords, it doesn't fit. So within here, we found a major chord and a minor chord. Let's go over to the left-hand side of the treble bridge. Oh yeah, here's another minor. But we found one at least. Over here, so we found two over on this side and one over on this side. Take my word for it, you can make a chord on any note on the instrument. Now, why no chords? Supposing all you want to do is be a lead player and uh, just play melodies. Well, there are probably many reasons, but I could tell you four right now. Number one, if you can build a, har uh, a chord on any note on the instrument, that means you can immediately find two harmony notes for any note on the instrument. So if you're looking for harmony, being able to establish a chord will give you a very close, proximate kind of set of harmonies. Secondly, the more you start building harmonies around on the instrument, the more chords you're able to construct anywhere on the instrument, the more you're going to know about the instrument. This thing is just a hunk of wood. It's not, there's no music in this. All the music comes from in here, and this is just a tool. The more you know about your tool, the better you'll be able to use it. Plumbers, auto mechanics, carpenters, video technicians, the better they know their equipment, the better things that they can produce from that. So the more you know about the instrument, the more this up, the forbidden upper regions of the bass bridge are no longer a mystery to you, the better musician you're going to be and the more music you're going to be able to give voice to on this instrument. Thirdly, you can become an accompanying musician. I know an old man out in Weezer, Idaho, who can't play a single melody on this, but he treats this like a piano. He'll go out to the fiddle contest, and he'll all day sit there and go. And you'll be playing the fiddle with him, and he'll, you'll tell him, go ahead and take a lead, and he says, what? I'm a dulcimer player. You play the lead. I'm supposed to play backup. 
When you're playing in an ensemble, one of the great things is being able to make room for other people making their music. And that means, as a dulcimer player, sitting back, being able to play accompaniment to someone else. It's going to be a lot more fun, and lots of people will be a lot more interested in playing with you if you don't always have to be the lead instrument. Chords are, are the roadmap for accompanying and tunes. And finally, this is a beautiful instrument for accompanying singing. And in fact, singing and accompanying singing is one of the ways that you can learn how to do these chords on the instrument. Now, you can, you can have all these fancy exercises, or you can simply be playing music and learning technique at the same time. For instance, you can build triangles based on any note on the instrument, but you also have to know what the names of those chords are to relate them to a song. So let's show you how you can use this, these chord charts that I've shown you. Tack up, say, the D and the A over your dulcimer, and we're going to play a simple tune like Skip to Maloo. And for the D triangle, we're going to start off using this one right here. That one, and for the A triangle, that one right there. And what you would do, for instance, is skip, skip, skip to my loo, skip, skip, skip to my loo, skip, skip, skip to my loo, skip to my loo, my darling. Now that's not going to win you any Grammys, but it's going to get you on the way to learning how to play the dulcimer as an accompanying instrument and get you used to playing chords. Now, some of the people that I learned from tended to look at the entire instrument as a chording instrument and could play all the little diagrams all the way up. So one way that you can become more conversant in the different areas of the dulcimer is, say, each verse switch to a different triangle. For instance, you may want to start down here. Skip, skip to my loo, and here's your A. Skip, skip, skip to my loo. And each verse, or each line, if you will, change to a different position of that triangle. That will get you playing in many different parts of the instrument, and you won't be just locked into playing one triangle for the key of D, for the D chord or one for the A chord. Because as you saw by the chord diagrams that I um, drew out for you, they're all over the instrument, and being able to play that in many different configurations all over the instrument, as I said, uh, will help you become more familiar with it, and ultimately you'll be a better musician. So let's go on to another tune. Review this part as much as you need to, and when you're all set to go on to the next tune, turn it on and we're going to dive into minor keys. One of my very favorite things about the dulcimer is that the minor keys seem to sound so rich on it. And I didn't really know a lot of uh, tunes in minor keys until I started playing the dulcimer. Now, this is an old tune called Lonesome John. And it's in the key of A and A minor, specifically. based on that triangle there. Now let me take you through the tune slowly at first. What I was just playing as you tuned back into us was um, considerably more complicated than you're able to digest right now, most likely. And then as we go along, there's a lot of new stuff that's happening in this tune that I'd like to point out to you. So slowing it down, starts off 
with a pickup note on the left hand side, third marked treble chorus. second part. A couple of the things that you're seeing is that I'm playing a lot of cross bridge octaves in where I'm playing on the left hand side of the treble bridge and the bass octave straight across. And the way you can find that is on a marked chorus and a chorus above a marked chorus. If you look through the bridge here, it's the note, it's the note directly above it. You just follow that through there. that as an ending. Now, a, a note here about one way to look at the dulcimer. As you look at the dulcimer here, you're looking straight down in it and you've got the treble courses going across here and you've got the bass courses weaving in there. And if you have a light soundboard, you have the shadows is coming through and you all those notes are doubled. One thing that I always do is I actually look at where the string crosses the bridge. And the lower part of the instrument, on this particular instrument, it's easy to see because the, the uh, bridge is scalloped from above and the, the uh, strings actually stand on what appear to be little pedestals. And I just aim for the right or the left hand side. Don't try to sit there and decipher all the strings as they mesh through there. Rather, look at where they cross the bridge and it's going to be a lot easier to figure out where you are. And then I just, on the treble bridge, aim to the right or the left or over in the bass bridge here. Aim just to the left of the bass bridge there. So you've got the octaves. Now, what we're starting to introduce here is some rhythmic rolls. It's just a little four note roll. The strings give a lot of bounce back. And I actually am bouncing. Watch this very carefully. What's happening is I'm doing four notes with only three strokes. I'm going right and then it's bouncing left, right. Now the, the hammer will bounce indefinitely. But you see what's going to happen is the bounces are going to get closer together and they're going to get softer in volume. So what you want to practice doing is getting one bounce, strike bounce because you've got to make them absolutely equal in both volume and in spacing. So practice first just going. And once you've got that bounce down, then you'll be ready to go strike, bounce, left, right. And it doesn't matter whether you go left, bounce, right, left, or right, bounce, left, right. And it's actually a lot easier to do fast than it is to slow it down. 
It'll work on a tabletop. Now you can use it for all different kinds of little accents, but let me hearken back to that technique I was telling you about, the suggestion about taking a technique that you've learned and starting to move it and try to expand it to be more than a simple four note roll. Now you can move this horizontally and this is a technique that we call the flam. Instead of just hammering this here, or using it as a four note roll to say start off um, the uh, theme song to Happy Trom's favorite television show. Or uh, a classical piece, which is the theme song to uh, Happy Trom's second favorite television show. You can also move this thing horizontally because really all you're doing is your you're striking and then bouncing. You don't have to stay on the same note. You can, for instance, strike it and then move your hand to the right and catch the bounce on the, on the neighboring chorus. Now what I'm doing is I'm striking here where my finger is. It bounces and then I'm, it bounces up and then I'm coming down on the bass chorus here. Those of you who are relating in terms of the, of the letters, this is a D. going over to a G. If I really slowed it down, the trajectory would be straight down, it's coming up, and then I'm sort of angling it in, so it comes in perpendicular to the curve of the strings here. Again, the purpose of it all is that you end up getting it evenly spaced, and of approximately the same va volume. So all of a sudden, for the first time, you're able to play two notes with one hand. The way this fits into this tune is... It's the four note roll, and then you hit the octus. Strike, bounce, left, together. Strike, bounce, left, right, together. a technique called the flam and you'll be able to use this for all kinds of things. I'll keep referring back to that but once again strike, bounce, over to the right. And if you play the left hand here at approximately the same time you can give the illusion of playing a chord. Move it down here. above. I'm just playing my third, my cross bridge, I'm flamming across. You'll also recognize some of the techniques that I talked about earlier. We have this in the second part. Or it's that, that anticipation with, with the subordinate hand, in this case the left hand. If we, if we didn't anticipate it, it would sound like this. Instead of. So you can see the ways in which you can use some of these techniques. What I want to do is take just a second and start expanding 
on this uh, roll a little bit and show how we can start using some other rhythmic uh, extensions, if you will, of the tune. Now we have this the four note roll. We've talked about moving it horizontal, the, the bounce horizontally. You want to start off even simpler, you start off, and then maybe just move the left hand to the other one, and then you, and hit the last note on another string yet. Then you can bounce to the other string. And the fourth note, of course, can be anywhere. Still exactly the same. It's just yet another example of taking a very simple technique and moving it. Now you can also move that bounce vertically. For instance, there's an old fiddle tune called Fisher's Hornpipe that starts off with a four note run up. If you want to preserve your hammering so that you start and your your four note roll up and hit the downbeat with your right hand or your lead hand, you can use that four note roll, moving it up vertically. Strike, bounce, left, right. Strike, bounce, left, right. Again. It's even easier to run it down. There's a lot of things that can be very handy in, in using different techniques with hammering because you're going to get into situations where you're going to be playing something along and all of a sudden you're going to run into a passage where it just isn't convenient to play the hammering pattern as you have it and you're going to find yourself wanting to cross over hammers or hit two notes at, at, in a row with the same ham, hand to, um, to make the whole thing work and it's going to seem clumsy. It's going to be like walking down the street and having to take two steps with your right or with your left foot in a row. You can use the, um, the roll, the four note roll here, either with the bounce or a strict alternation, right, left, right, left or left, right, left, right, to preserve or change your hammering. And you can do it within a measure. You can make it, you can switch from leading with your right to leading with your left and then go back again in the course of a single measure simply by knowing that you can do that. Also, don't forget about your duplicated notes because they too will give you alternatives in hammering pinches when you need another note. If you, if you can remember that, uh, you'll, you'll realize when you get into this clumsy situation that there are other places on the instrument where you can find the notes you need. Let's take a second now and talk about some other rhythmic techniques. One of my favorite rhythmic techniques is a two against three. The reason I'm bringing this one up is because it's one of many rhythmic techniques, but it's very easy to learn. A pattern that you can do is together, right, left, right, together, right, left, right, together, right. That's the pattern, and it doesn't change. Together, right, left, right, together, right, left, right, together, right. Now, using the same idea of moving and any technique that you uh, learn. Let's do the same uh, process that we did with 
uh, the four not roll. Let's do cross bridge harmonies. is my right and my left hands are starting to move independently because what's happening, even if you take it back to that original together, right, left, right, together, right, left, right, together, right. If you isolated the hammers, put them on different sides of the bridges, what would be happening? Your right hand is steadily going and your left hand is going... So what we're getting at is the idea of starting off with a basic, simple technique and gradually expanding it until you end up from practicing this. To all of a sudden, you've learned how to make your hands move independently with your right hand providing an ostinato here and your left hand being able to do a melody like the next tune, Scully's Reel. The tune itself goes... That's the A part. The B part goes. And again. Now, how can you use that bass ostinato? You learn how to play the melody with your left hand. And you get your right hand. start expanding the flam with this one. See that? Flam across. Same time with your left hand. Cross, 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 third. Now, you can do this one of two ways. Cross, Do 
cross bridges all the way up. Or let me ex uh, offer another way of doing it. We've been talking about the triangles. You've got a triangle here. What you can do is you can expand a three note roll here, which is your triangle broken up into a four note roll by adding the octave above of the root of that triad there. And you remember from the very beginning of this video how to find the octave. Cross to the right. Here's your tri triad and add the octave above there. We'll call that the four note roll. Four note. Maybe a I'm just bouncing twice. And then maybe, here's, here's just a four note roll with a flam at your left and catch, this is the fourth note. Four note roll. Cross. Scully's Reel. It's an, old, it's an old New England tune I learned from my friend Dudley Laufman. Now you can uh, peck around at it a little bit. You've got a lot of new stuff to chew on this time. You've got some rhythmic variations. You've got the expansion of the four note, of the three note roll to a four note roll. But wait a minute, don't stop there. Well, you can make a five note roll by adding the octave above of the second element. To make the three into the four, we went Here's the octave. But a word of warning here, every time that you start stretching yourself out vertically, start thinking about how to compact this all horizontally and you need to know your duplicated notes. So for instance, here is, here, here are the five notes. Because you're adding the octave above of this note right here. Can you find that note elsewhere? Well, count down five go across to the left, by golly, there it is. So instead of stretching yourself out this way, you can play it this way, which is gonna make you more accurate and faster. It only stands to reason that you can expand it to a six note roll by adding the octave of the third. So here's the three, here's the four, here's the five, and here's the six. and you can figure out how to make the seven, eight, nine, and 27 note rolls. Let's stop the tape for a minute, go back, rewind it, digest what you need to, and when you're ready, come on in and we'll head for the home stretch. Good luck. Welcome back. We're coming into the home stretch now of this homespun video, and I'm gonna put down one more tune for you that's gonna sort of pull a lot of this stuff together. And then at the end of this tune, I'm going to sort of refer in a brief way to some of the um, review of all the stuff and also uh, tell you about the things like the dampers and chromatics and so on that I referred to early in the tape. So let's launch into this tune. This is a tune by the Irish harp composer Terlico Carolyn and it's called Planxty Fanny Power. Planxty is a Gaelic word which basically means in honor of. So let me uh, knock it out here for you and then we'll talk about it.
It's a beautiful little tune. It's always been one of my favorites. Now, it's pulling together a lot of the techniques that we've already been talking about and introducing some others and, uh, and some variations on them, which I think you'll probably recognize. Let's start from the top. Cross bridge and then a flam. Cross. Flam triad here. And then we're gonna run up. Now what's happening here is you're descending with your left hand and, and you're, it's a syncopated descension. And you're doing a very even. And together that sounds like. So it goes. that cross and then again even with your right hand and a flat now you repeat that What you're doing here is you've got a, a, a triangle and then a four note roll, flam. Now that is putting an awful lot of the techniques together that we've used so far. And I'd like to use this as sort of a summarizing point for this, um, for this video. There's a lot of things that I, I would love to touch on. Um, and I was, there's all, basically I'd, I'd like to be able to spend a lot more time with all this. I think I've given you some real good seeds. As many of you know, I do have an audio tape series, and if you're interested in that, that goes into six hours worth of expanding on a lot of these techniques. However, a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm doing here are things that um, are not quite covered yet, techniques I hadn't yet developed on the, when I did the audio tapes. You also have the advantage of being able to see firsthand me doing these things. Um, but let me show you something uh, about these, these dampers briefly, because uh, you can also do, I, before I had dampers, I used, well, what, what you have here, I put gaffer's tape over the top of the uh, courses here and marked it with a uh, magic marker for the markings. This basically is a foot powered, just a string run through there and spring steel. And uh, on the tune Planks de Fanny Power, for instance, you can make it sound much more like a harp, which of course was the instrument for which this tune was originally written.
Of all the experiments that I've been doing with the dulcimer, I'm the most excited about the dampers. Uh, and hopefully there will, there will come a time years down the line when the advocation of uh, dampers for hammer dulcimers will seem like an old-fashioned kind of idea. But uh, the Eastern European ancestors and contemporaries of the hammer dulcimer have dampers. And my own, from my own experience, this introduces a whole other, uh, it's almost like having two instruments in one. You can make it sound like a marimba or a harp, many other things. If you don't, if, if you don't have dampers on your instrument, you may try just covering the, the bridge tops here, right over the strings, with gaffer's duct tape and mark where the markings are just so you can see. And you'll get an idea of what the sound is like. It's, it's an exciting new technique of using the dulcimer. All along, we've also been talking about a 1211 instrument. I've made re reference to 15, 14, and 18, 17. If you're going to be making the leap from a 1211 to a bigger instrument, where does it go? Well, uh, what happens with a 1514 is you add three courses on the bottom of each of the uh, courses. What that means is, in essence, for instance, a 1514, we would take the tape here off that we put on earlier, and the bass bridge, rather than just going down to a D, would all, go all the way down to a D. The 1211 instrument affords you the possibility of playing in the keys of D and G, A, C, and F. Also in their relative minors, which would be um, B minor and E minor, F sharp minor and C sharp minor, D minor. Now, on the 1514, you have the ability to go down to a low, rich D. And, the, and down here, you would, in the treble cor, uh, bridge, I don't have one here, but you would have the low key of A. And 1817 would, would add three additional courses on top of a 1514. So you have the ability to stretch out in all possible directions. I mentioned early on that I do have this funny little bridge over here. What that affords me is, number one, the ability to make my instrument shorter. This instrument has been built light and small so that I can carry it on airplanes and throw it over my shoulder at festivals and so on. So the D that is up here on probably your instrument, the very highest note is actually this note right here. And I actually have an E above that. The other four notes fill in the chromatic notes that you may find yourself wanting in the course of uh, your playing. There's a D sharp and a G sharp and an A sharp or B flat right here. It makes the instrument chromatic for over two and a half octaves. Chromatic shouldn't probably figure into your playing if you are a beginner for some time yet. However, know that the possibilities do exist of uh, tuning your instrument slightly differently, uh, frequently take duplicated notes like the G and the A up here, or other stray notes that you do have alternatives for and tune them to the notes that you need. Um, this will afford you the possibility to play in many, many different keys and play things that uh, currently you may find uh, the limitations of the instrument preventing you from playing. Hopefully, this catalog of techniques that I've offered you in this video will form the basis from which you can work in developing an even larger catalog from your own discoveries. This series is not designed to be a, an end-all in your playing, but hopefully you will glean enough information from the things that I've taught you here and uh, some ideas I may have planted in your brain that will afford you the opportunity to, to make your own music. It's no fun and it's not my intention that you end up simply being uh, little clones of my playing, playing these arrangements of these tunes, but rather that you have the ideas and the flexibility and the sense of freedom that you can go on 
and make your own music because that's what playing instruments, singing, and making music is all about anyway. So good luck. Hope I'll see you out there on the road. Please let us know if you have any suggestions because we're always interested in making these things clear and uh, more fulfilling to the people who take them home with them. Thanks a lot and good luck.